All over Britain, there are archaeological sites that are too dangerous to access or excavate. They could contain unique and valuable evidence of our past, which if not investigated, will be lost forever. EXA is a team of highly skilled archaeologists. Katie Hurst, in charge of excavation. Alice Roberts, doctor and expert in human bones. Meg Waters, geophysicist and digital imaging specialist. All experts in their chosen fields who are determined to get into these inhospitable places to forensically assess, survey and extract the evidence. The expedition leader will be me, Mark Davis, volcanologist, climber, caver and diver. This is archaeology on the very edge. This week we are all on a steep learning curve as we investigate this Shetland sea stack that could have once been home to a group of solitary monks. This is the Came of Eisbister, a jagged tongue of rock in the far north of Shetland. This inhospitable place holds the key to solving a strange archaeological mystery. These rectangular features appear to be the remains of houses. So the big question is, who would choose to live in a remote and barren landscape like this? Now, no archaeologist has had the privilege of setting foot on the Came. EXA is about to be the first. 200 miles north of the Scottish mainland, the Came of Eisbister is one of the most remote archaeological sites in Britain. Came, meaning rocky point or promontory, describes perfectly this wild and precipitous coastline. These strange rectangular features were first observed over 100 years ago and have fascinated archaeologists ever since. But because no one has ever got nearer than this, speculation as to their history has been rife. They could have their origins in Shetland's dark Pictish past. They could be part of a monastery. No one knows for sure. EXA has been invited here to finally put speculation to rest. 30 miles north of the nearest town, two miles east of the nearest house, getting close to the site is an expedition in itself. And we've arrived in October, not exactly the best time for an archaeological excavation. As the team wait for the weather to clear, they've got time to reflect on the remoteness of the site. What you have to really think about is why on earth would anybody go onto that cave? It's completely <laughs> isolated. And so exposed, the only people who I can yeah. think of who are going to do that are uh, a monastic community, monks. Yeah, certainly good for sure. solitary yeah. contemplation out there. Exactly. When, but the other thing that they could be are leper colonies as well. That would be amazing. Yeah. I mean, if we if we find any evidence of, of skeletons with leprosy, so le leprosy is quite sort of uh, easy to diagnose on the, on the skeletons. It's really vital to find out what date these structures are. Sure. So we're going to have to look for things like pottery or carbon-14 dating, okay, also terrific. things like hearths. We can okay. get, get charred grain, charred wood. Good. With this strong wind, it's going to be a bit of a challenge, but we'll try to get some, some good data out of it. But hearths should show up. Why is it going to be a challenge? It's uh, because it's so windy, because the, the magnetometer itself is going to get buffeted by the wind. and. When you collect it, it needs to be very steady, very straight on the same plane the whole time. Right. So we'll give it a good go, see, see what it's like. Okay, yeah. well, Maybe if you start see. doing that, and yep. uh, we can start opening up some trenches. We just have to get over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the access onto the site is one of the most extreme we've so far attempted. A 50-metre knife-edge arete, a 20-metre climb, another longer knife-edge, then an even higher climb, made worse by gusting wind and rain. The delivery team have spent two days rigging hundreds of metres of rope, fixed to the shallow soil by steel anchors. The axis is severe, even by their standards. All right, guys, well, this is as far as we're going to be able to go without being clipped on, so we've set these ropes up. The ones along the ground are just going to clip into, and at various stages you'll have to transfer over. So first of all, we've got these two ropes that you're going to 
going to get you to the short climb here. Now you're about 150 feet or so above the sea. Um, it's very steep on both sides. Um, you're going to have to be transferring over from one line to the other. Is it safe with all this wind howling across? It's really exposed, isn't it? Well, it's safe as long as we're actually clipped into something. Just always, always, always make sure they are attached at one point. OK. And, and Bean, uh, these ribbons are strong enough to take our weight, are they? This is Kevlar. This can take uh, up to about four tonnes of weight. There's really? absolutely no way this is going to break. For safety reasons, the team have to negotiate each stage of the axis, one at a time. Katie is the first to face the long walk. The sheep track across the arete is badly eroded, with great areas of undercutting and slippage on either side. The other side of the rope. Underneath it. The route is only one boot wide and extremely slippy. I see what you mean about the rock being crumbly. If you take off in the wind, I've got you attached. I'll reel you back in. Poor weather conditions and the crumbly state of the rock have made the going very slow. This will severely restrict our time on site. Yeah, absolutely. Do whatever it takes to get up here. Katie's slip at least proves all the safety systems are fully working. The delay is giving Meg time to reflect on her upcoming ordeal. It looks really daunting to me. And, and being so slippery and windy like this, I just, I, I am a bit nervous. into that black rope, please, before we come up this bit. With Katie on the final stretch, Meg is faced with the biggest, slippiest and wettest rock climb she's so far attempted. She'll climb it. She'll be fine. Good. Well done, Meg. Nice, looking good. By the time Alice sets off, the wind and rain has got much worse. Well, having said I wasn't worried about it, having seen two people go ahead of me um, and a lot of rocks fall off, I'm slightly more worried. It's slippery, isn't it? tries to duck the gusts, our cameraman is not so quick and gets blown off. A bone jar in three metre fall. The safety lines hold and Jamie escapes with a cut finger and dented camera. It's hard to imagine who in their right mind would live in a place like this. It's got two 120 feet cliffs that just drop down to the sea and on the far side there's a 30 degree slope that just edges down to the churning water itself. Local archaeologist Val Turner has been puzzled by the structures on the cane for almost 20 years. There are two possibilities, really. Either that it's early Christian, or alternatively, that it's a leper colony. So a group of outcasts? Yes, people who were shunned by society. Right. Although society would keep on feeding them or whatever, they um, didn't want close contact with. So when you say Christians, what sort of age are we looking at there? Well, it could be Pictish, in which case it would be from about 600 to 800 AD, something like that. But, but why would they send Christians out onto that rocky promontory? I mean, it's, it's pretty barren, isn't it? Well, it could be monastic. Yeah. Or alternatively, it could be more like a place that they went for retreat. Okay, so contemplation, retreat, 
And if it's a leper colony, what sort of date are we looking at there? That would be later. That would be either late medieval or really um, quite recent. I mean, it could extend over any period within okay. that. So if you've got a wish list for EXA, what would that be? Definitely to find out the date and to find out who lived here. OK. And your hunch? Well, I have a suspicion that it might be Pictish Christians, but we shall see. The only other person in modern times to get onto the cane was George Gordon Coburn, a theology student and amateur climber, who in 1876 discovered the rectangular features. So as Alice nears the summit, our team are the first archaeologists ever to set foot on the site. That's amazing! They're not on a slope, are they? They're terraced down the hill. It's faster than it looks on the aerial yeah. photograph, yeah. And they're bigger as well than, the, than what I thought. So does it just, just drop away beyond there? Yeah, it looks like um, it drops really steeply, doesn't yeah. it, Meg? And then there's, then another, there's another terrace, yeah. and there's some more structures down there as well. Really? Yeah, yeah come, come on down. down. <laughs> you see the wall here? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is this is about a metre high. It's really substantial, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And this is spacious. This doesn't look like a a little sort of cell monastic cell. cell. I think it's too big to be a monastic yeah. cell. It's and they're all stoic. I mean, if you had one big structure, maybe a few smaller ones. Yeah, but might... they're all pretty big. Although although there are um, bigger ones and smaller ones. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Is there but these are all pretty big. It might up be here. a monastery. A monastery itself. Back in 1876, Coburn reported seeing 23 enclosures. Katie, Alice and Meg count only 19. So even though the came still covers an area of over 5,000 square metres, it's obviously eroding into the sea at an alarming rate. But the scale of the site and structures raises more questions than it answers. If you think, if one person lives in each of these structures, how many people would actually live out here? So if, if we could, if they're like 19 or 20, that's a lot of people. Yeah, it's not just you can, it's not just a monk or two in a cell. You doing could a fit thing. a whole family in each of these. Yeah. Rooms. Well, and, and that's and then so we have to think about population. If you assume that a family consists of four people, that's almost 80 individuals. How could they have possibly survived? At least I think I've worked out how they got onto the stack. Well, you might think this is utter madness. If people lived on the cane, they'd have to go across this knife edge. But bear in mind that hundreds of years ago, this probably was quite a fair way. The problem is with all these cliffs around here is that they all slip in and cascade in into the sea. And this has probably gone in the last few hundred years or so. Even if the access across the arete was much easier in the past, how did this mysterious community bring food and supplies across? How and where did they get fresh water? Where would they have got firewood? Shetland is barren of trees. <laughs> the Came is a perfect place to defend, but from whom? As well as finding a date for this place, it looks like we've got lots more questions to answer. Well, it's windy, it's treacherous. I've slipped about three times coming across. This really is extreme archaeology. It's taken us the best part of a day to get the first ever team of archaeologists onto the Came of Eisbister in Shetland. Finally, I get to join them. Hello! <laughs> Blown a bit, isn't it? This is, this is incredible. It's isn't it? It's, it's incredible, amazing. isn't it? Yeah. So each one of these depressions is a, is a house, is a, or a building of yeah, some it's sort. It's a building of some sort, yeah. yeah. I still don't know what it is. And, and there are walls some of them, visible. Some you of them. can see the entranceway into some of them. There's so a couple stuff. of rows here, and then there's a big there's a big slope, and then there's another one or another couple yeah. down the hill. Yeah. So how are we going to go about doing this investigation then, Meg? What are you going right. to do first? Well, I think we're going to start and cover the place really quickly with magnetometry, because part of the evidence that we're looking for could be in a hearth, it could be some charred charred seeds or, or some sort of material. Mm. So and that gives us dating as well. Okay, so what are we going to do? Are we going to open up trenches first? Or? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm tempted to um, put a trench across one of the structures and maybe take it across to another one so we can get a sort of comparison of, of two structures. 
The 19 visible features are very closely packed together. Some appearing to share adjoining walls, whilst others have alleyways between. This is completely unlike any monastic retreat yet excavated, where monk cells have been found to be circular beehive structures, only big enough for one person. The scale of the site does beg the question whether this could actually be the monastery itself. With most of the usable hand and foot holes pulled off the rock face during access, the delivery team have been busy rigging more safety lines and extra anchor points to give the team a safe exit. So there's been no time to bring any excavation tools across. The delivery team are getting concerned about the weather, hypothermia and the time. So you want to start offloading them now, Mike? I reckon. Um, it's going to take at least an hour to get everyone off. Yeah. There's a load of storms coming in, I think. You know, loads yeah, of there is. It's forecast storm, so... It's freezing. The archaeologists are extremely disappointed, but have to follow the delivery team's orders. It's much harder than you imagine it's going to be. It's really quite hairy, especially coming back this way, because uh, you've just got sheer drops on either side of you. It's, it's pretty nasty. I just want to be right back at the other side now. I want a, I want a hot drink inside me. It's not even that far away. You could walk there in half a minute. That face there is really, really crummy. You've got the wind lashing against you. But uh, the, the archaeology is absolutely fantastic. I don't know if it's fantastic because I just personally, I just get a feeling that those buildings are just a little bit too luxurious for a monk. They're, they're big and um, just it just seems a little bit odd, a little bit odd, but can't say at the moment. I really want to get digging, that's the thing. This climbing has been a little more than I expected. <laughs> I had some uh, rather scary moments. I lost a footing, I pulled a rock out, and uh, it's only my second time actually climbing like this up a cliff face, so... It was good. This site is fantastic. It's really, really great, and there's a lot more to it than, than meets the eye than we saw in the aerial photographs. So it's really exciting. I can't wait to uh, get down to work there. I think it's fair to say that anyone who actually lived over there must have been completely insane. It's freezing cold. The wind is hitting across your face. The other thing is that we've done no archeology. span Fine, it's been great. We've set foot on the cane. That's a first. But as far as the archaeology goes, we're nowhere near to solving who actually lived there. And for me, that's disappointing. It's our first night under canvas. We are staying on site to give ourselves the chance of an early start tomorrow morning and to get a feel for what it must have been like for those early inhabitants trying to survive in such a barren and hostile location. We've had to bring in all our food and supplies, albeit from the nearest supermarket, but it does beg the question as to how our stack dwellers fed themselves. They could well be trading with other people. Or, I mean, if it, I mean monastic communities often were uh, supported by the, the mother church and uh, monks would come over and bring supplies across to, to the monks. Because um, the monks who were sort of contemplating God in their, in their isolation were often there, not not for the whole of their lives, they were there just for a season. I've read lots of archaeological science papers looking at pot residue analysis, you know, they scrape the inside of the pot and then they work out what exa exactly oh, what they're eating. What was there, yeah? Mostly cabbage soup. People in the past generally yeah. mostly cabbage, cabbage soup. Cabbage soup. So I think we're recreating it fairly well. Reality TV has finally made it to Shetland and already the diary tent has a steady queue of dissatisfied customers. I'm a bit disappointed with uh, what we've got done today. Um, well, it's, I mean, it's been amazing. We've had a, we've had a good look round, and um, it is, you know, it's really, it's still, a, you know, a great privilege to be the first people on the island and everything. I just, you know, think that with so little time, it would have been good if we could have got some of the kit over and actually started um, doing something. We're really behind now to have a whole day without any digging. It's um, quite 
shocking really. <laughs> I'm gonna have to work really hard tomorrow. But um be okay. What I really want to be able to do is contribute to what we're doing with um, some good maps, but it's gonna it's gonna take a little bit of time. Um, so I've been a little worried about that. I'm gonna go to bed tonight in a tent on a bog in the middle of the Shetland Islands. It's October, it's wet, it's windy. They're expecting gale force winds tomorrow. Life is not fair. Well, my worst nightmares have come true. The severe weather conditions have actually come in. It's about one degree with the wind chill and air pressure's still dropping, so the worst is yet to come. I mean, we got on there yesterday and they all looked spectacular, but unless we start excavating today, we'll never know who actually lived on the cane. It's not normal rain. It's it rain, normal rain that goes down would be so much a problem. It's the fact that it's horizontal makes things more difficult. Because of extra safety duties yesterday, the delivery team have even more work to do today. All the excavation and geophysics equipment has to be lifted, tied and dragged to the site by zip wire. We were hoping to get an early start, but bad weather has made us later than ever. 10 o'clock in the morning. We've got eight hours left of this. And everyone is already soaked. Probably getting pretty damn cold. We've yet to get them over to the windiest part, and then all the work starts. I think it's going to be a really interesting day. The team have found a relatively dry place to plot a trench strategy. Well, I guess it'd be great to have one that went across the wall and into on either side. That's exactly what I think. That's yeah, what yeah. Then, yeah. Then we can get yeah. two yeah. floors for the price of one, basically. Exactly, can't yes. We? And the that structure room. in between of the wall and that's how it's right. Built. Yeah, I think it's really important to get the structure of the wall. I think that's yeah. going to be mm. um, potentially it's quite diagnostic, and also of course the, the fines. But not taking down the wall, just no, going no, down no, 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 no. Yeah. I think I think what you want to do is go down onto the archaeology and see what's there, yeah. rather than start just digging into yeah, it, yeah. the walls and things. Within half an hour, the storm has passed. As we enter a period of relative calm, it's time to get the team on site. We're all just raring to go, really, because we've got the kit over there now, so we can actually do some archaeology. After yesterday's difficulties, the delivery team have rigged an easier method of access. Instead of climbing, Katie, Meg and Alice are using mechanical ascenders to pull themselves up the rope. It's still not easy given the slippery conditions. <laughs> Once on site, it's straight down to work. Meg is going to carry out a geophysical survey on the slope and terrace below the rectangular features. Katie has opened a trench across one of the walls between two of the structures. The Cane is a scheduled ancient monument. Historic Scotland has given us permission to open a few small trenches, so it's essential we position these accurately. In the calm before the next storm, the delivery team are facing a new challenge. So we've got all three members of the delivery team trying to get Val up now. She's never done any climbing in her life before. So you can imagine if we were quite scared with all the wind on the arete yesterday, she's going to be absolutely caking herself. But I can understand why she's doing it. The sense of anticipation must be phenomenal because she's wanted to get onto that stack for nearly 17 years and only now she has the opportunity to do it. We need you there, Val. She seems to be doing all right, though. How did you find it? Wow! <laughs> I'm here, that's the important thing. <laughs> 
fully recovered from her ordeal. Val gets a tour of the site. First stop, Katie's Trench, across the wall between two buildings. Can you, can you see this here? Yes. That line? Yeah. The big oh, boulders on that side, but all these little ones. It's looking like so they're infilling a, an entrance way. It certainly does, yeah. The adjoining wall is really substantial, and this carefully blocked up doorway proves that the two buildings were once interconnected, not your average monastic cell. You come over here, you can see the other structure to oh, the other right, yeah. side, yeah. and it's literally, they look as though they're sharing the same wall. Once I took, took away the turf, I've got a bit of a, an empty patch. I'm just wondering whether yeah. it's a turf wall. Yes, I expect you're right, actually, that's can you, Yeah, You can see these yes, dark patches here. Yes, yes. Which might mean that it's um, been packed with turf. Vikings certainly built like that. Vikings had stone on either side and a turf in the core. That's really exciting. It is. But is this, can you st say that this is definitely the only time that they used this kind of construction technique in the Viking period? Um... I'm not sure that I'd go absolutely quite that far, but it's certainly indicative. We've certainly got that on the west of, um, on the west coast of Norway, which is the nearest part of Norway to here. Oh. Um, houses at Ullenhag, for example, and also at Jarlshof, when Jarlshof was dug, that's what they found. Val may be hedging her bets, but the fact remains that the first people in Shetland to build rectangular houses were the Vikings. So if this complex of buildings is the remains of a Viking settlement, why did they build their houses in such an inhospitable place? And does this mean that our monastic retreat theory needs to be revised? I still think a uh, sort of religious community is your most likely explanation. Yeah. But, but I... possibly a Viking one. Possibly, yeah. yeah. Viking or Norse, yeah. 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 It's just so good to be here. Yeah, no, it's fantastic, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> There is no reliable date for when the Vikings first arrived in Shetland, but they did begin raiding mainland Britain in 790 AD. As pagans, the Vikings attacked and destroyed Christian communities, but by 900, they themselves had been converted to Christianity. So is our site pagan Viking, or from the time after the conversion? Finding the date for the buildings is now more crucial than ever. After the most exciting site visit of her career, Val negotiates the route back with new enthusiasm. It's amazing. I think it's um, Viking. It's a, it's a Viking type of construction, Viking to North type of construction, with um, stone on either side of a turf core. And that's typical West Norwegian uh, construction for that sort of period, Viking uh, North period. So why not? Yeah, looks good. With the 19 rectangular features clearly visible on the ground, Meg has been surveying the slope leading down to the lower terrace. Her aim is to see via magnetometry if there are any subsurface features not visible to the naked eye. It's a huge area to cover, but we urgently need to find out the extent of our site. We also need a date. The likely place to find date in evidence is on the floor of one of the structures. Katie's working flat out. It's finally time for me to get down to work. Well, it's all hands to the pump. Meg's down there doing a geophysical survey. Katie's still working there. And she's tasked me with opening up another trench in this rectangular feature right in the corner. And the reason for that is, at the moment, we still don't know whether anyone actually lived on the cane. As far as we're concerned, it still could be for animals. We haven't found artifacts that says, yep, someone lived here. Still a mystery. Could this corner conceal the date and evidence we are looking for? We are here at the Cane of Eisbister in the far north of Shetland. We are investigating these strange rectangular features on this precipitous promontory. It's one of the most extreme sites we've ever attempted. We've had driving rain, gale force winds, and treacherous slippery rock faces to contend with. But we've succeeded in getting the first ever team of archeologists onto the cane. We've already turned up a major surprise. Instead of an early Christian monastic retreat, we appear to have found a series of Viking buildings. 
But with absolutely no finds, we are still no nearer to discovering the date of these structures. The team are becoming despondent. What we've really got to do now is get a piece of evidence. We need yeah. a find. We need to find something. That, sure. The stuff that I've been digging out has got absolutely nothing in it. Nothing You've got no all. charcoal yeah. for dating nothing. or nothing like that. No. Meg, have you found anything in your survey? Um, well, we've, we've covered the whole of the bottom part of, the, of this little island here, um, but I actually can't really see anything in the data until I look at it in my computer. Katie, just going back to what we finished off talking about yesterday, I mean, we talked about sort of Pictish versus Norse, but is there still any sort of idea that this might be a monastic or a, could it still be a leper colony? I really still have absolutely no idea, but the, just the shape of these houses look very much like uh, a Nordic Christian site. Right, so that's I think, all we can say. I think the that's, that's, the, that's the plus point today, right? Yeah. I mean, I know we haven't found any artefacts, but, you know, that's the thing. Yeah. We've come across walls that are not built in Shetland, yeah. or even in Scotland like yeah. that. The nearest yeah. is Norway, and that, that is a good, that's yeah. a good thing to and bring up. And you've got to remember that, right? as well that so few of these stacks have ever been excavated in, in the Shetlands, yeah. and really very few people know what, what's going on here. Um, in terms of the logistics, are you a lot happier than yesterday? Did it work today? Food yeah. Wise, getting over yeah, we got the kit over. No, actually, I'm not. No. Because we, so. I got half of the work done today that I thought I would. Okay. We we waited around in the morning. This mm. the kit didn't get over here at eight o'clock mm. straight away like we said it was going to. And okay. the whole point of our sleeping out here last night was actually to get out here and get to work at, at sunup, and it didn't happen. point of view of uh, project management, this is the bit that uh, I dread more than anything else and the reason for that is everyone's coming across cold but they're also complacent and uh, mistakes can be made and I've been on so many expeditions where it's actually finishing and on the way back is when all the accidents occur. So fingers crossed, everyone will concentrate right till the very end. Everyone made it off safely, but no one's relishing the thought of another night under canvas. It looks like the diary tent is in for a busy evening. I'm an osteologist with no bones. It's, uh, I, I feel, I just want some bones, really. I don't think I'm gonna get any on this one. Um, I don't know, it's probably, I'm probably just getting a bit down because I'm tired as well. I'm very tired. Very tired. I'm very cold. My feet really small. I'm aching all over. It was good fun. It's the beginning of our final day on site, and I'm on a mission. There's too many questions about this place that still need an answer. Firstly, how did the people who built the structures get on and off the cane? I'm pretty sure that our route would have been much wider 1,500 years ago. It could easily have been 10 metres across. By my reckoning, in the next few decades, all of this will fall away, leaving the cane an isolated sea stack. Even if large chunks of rock have fallen away, it doesn't explain how they negotiated this first climb. It also doesn't explain how they transported the building stone to the site. There must have been another way onto the promontory. One of the things that puzzles me on this site is the amount of stone that's gone into building these walls. Now, the only place you find that amount is at the bottom of these sea cliffs in the talus slope. So, somehow, whoever lived here had to transport all the blocks in. So they would have had to have climbed it up the sea cliff, all the way around the top of the headland, across the arete and onto the cane, or the other way is in by sea. Now I know which way I'd rather do it, and that's by sea itself. So Trevor and I are gonna look for any man-made features such as a natural wharf. It's an extremely long shot after such a passage of time and constant battering by the sea. I think, that, see this feature here, right? I think this has been, that's collapsed. And I think that, you know, it wasn't, you know, this used to be a joint to that. If that was the case, this juts out a lot further. That's quite a nice, uh, nice place to be in, eh? 
you know, you can imagine bringing your boat in here. Yeah, yeah if, you, if, and if you could, again, with it with a, a, a low tide, scramble out onto these ledges. It's been estimated that the sea levels have risen four to five metres over the past 1,500 years. So it's entirely possible that this rocky promontory could have provided some sort of landing stage. Let's not forget that the Vikings were master mariners and probably used to negotiate in trickier landings than this. As Trevor and I try and find a way back up the cliff, the solution to another major question presents itself. How did they collect fresh water? Again, the answer appears to be geological. Rainwater still percolates down through the peat and collects here at the rock face. Given the climate of Shetland, having enough drinking water appears not to be a problem. Meg's geophysical survey of the lower slope and terrace is complete. She's covered over 1,500 square metres and the results are promising. Well, looking at the magnetometry data from yesterday, uh, there are a few hot spots, as we call them, of, of high magnetic value or low, but, but areas of interest. One of those is adjacent to um, the place where Alice, Alice is actually excavating right now. It's closer, um, I think it's, it's south of what looks like the exterior wall of the structure. They show no more rectangular features on the lower levels but do indicate areas of very high and very low magnetism. These could be areas of burning, perhaps domestic hearths or even small kilns. On rare occasions, they've even been found to be cremation sites. The shape and alignment of the features is completely unlike anything on the top terrace. So Alice has opened a trench on this distinctly boat-shaped area. We don't know whether these lower features are contemporary with the rectangular buildings up top. But, and it's a big but, if this feature is also Viking, then this could be all that remains of a pagan boat burial. Well, Katie and I came down and had a look this morning and we decided to open trench here because as you can see we're in the middle of a, of a feature. We're in the middle of something which is a bit, it's a bit of an odd shape because it's not rectangular um, like the other features up the top of the hill got a sort of curved into it, almost a sort of boat shape up there. But anyway, what we've done is put a, um, a trench in across um, the rim around the edge, which presumably is a wall. And I'm coming down on stones, which <laughs> suggests it might be a wall. Viking boat burials are extremely rare in Shetland. Only a handful have ever been found and excavated. They were constructed by laying the deceased inside an actual longboat or sometimes a boat-shaped cairn of small rocks. As things are slowly beginning to make sense on the lower slopes, Katie is working up top in the corner trench I started yesterday and is finally coming down onto the conclusive evidence we've been searching for. It's our last afternoon on site and we're still searching for that elusive piece of date and evidence. Katie's now moved over to the trench I started yesterday, in the corner of one of the structures. Well, I think I've actually struck what looks like to be a floor surface. Can you see where all this black stuff is here? Yeah, what is here. that? It's all charcoal. You can even make out individual bits of stick yeah, going through here. So, um, this looks as though it's, it's either part of a hearth or it's um, been trampled across on the floor. But the floor, is, it's just so important to find the floor because you, you often find all sorts of bits trampled in, like pottery and bone and things like that. So the importance of the charcoal in this is, is the dating of it? Yeah, because we haven't actually got a, an absolute date yet for these buildings. All we can say so far is that the way they've been built, with the stone and the turf in between, is probably Viking, but we have this charcoal is so so important because we can actually get a really spot on date from that. The charcoal doesn't prove categorically that people lived here, but it does prove someone, at the same time the floor of the building was in use, lit a fire. But it would be nice to leave the site knowing the date of the structures. One single piece of domestic pottery would decide the matter once and for all. 117. 
Meg is doing some additional survey work to try and give herself a digging target. Alice is still working on this boat-shaped feature, our possible Viking burial, but she's not finding any trace of wood, metal or bone. I'm a bit intrigued by that stone over there, which is large and doesn't seem to be part of the wall sort of collapsing in. So I just wonder whether it's part of whatever building was here and whether it was, you know, sort of placed in the middle of it. But it would be lovely to have some, some artefactual evidence as well. With the light failing and the weather closing in, it's clear that Alice is not going to have enough time to excavate it completely. We've only got a couple of hours to go before I pull the plug on this excavation. The winds are persistent. They were 70 mile an hour through the night and they've continued all the way through the day. Katie's opening her final trench in the doorway of another building, a small one meter square test pit. It doesn't take long to get to the bottom of what looks like another empty trench. The frustration is obvious. I really wish we could find just, we only just need one find and that, that would tell us who lived here. We're running out of time now. Yeah, we? we're, we're, we're getting really pushed for time. Yeah. I think Meg is going to, once she's finished her jig fizz, we're going to get her to open up another small trench like this. Just do, get as many trenches as possible yeah. just to try exactly. and find something. Exactly. There may be a very simple religious reason why the site is devoid of finds. If you think about a monastic community, um, they might have been very frugal. They might have had very, very few possessions. Um, and things like pottery, they could even have done without. They could have had skins for storing uh, water, milk and stuff. Um, they could have used the local stone for sitting on. You know, you, you're not going to, not necessarily going to find anything here. That's and all right. their rubbish could have been chucked into the sea. Meg's decided to open her final trench on the lower terrace at the pointy end of Alice's boat-shaped feature. With this test pit, we've now dug a full allocation of trenches. I think it may be too little too late. I know it, it took a couple of days to do your geophysical survey, yeah. and you've only got a one by one, but uh, at the end of the day, this is our last chance. Because all the other <laughs> trenches have found nothing. They found yeah. collapsed walls, but... Um, no artefacts that no tells us who actually lived here. Yeah. This is our last well, shot, really. Well, hopefully we'll... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Comes okay, out to the dig. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> the problem with this site for me is, is that we've come here, we've done a lot of work, hard graft, yeah. not come up with hard and fast answers, but opened up a whole can of worms that's given loads more questions. Well, I think the problem everything. is as well that there haven't been that many comparable sites excavated. So we can't even say, oh yes, and there was another one like this somewhere else in, no. Sh in Shetland. Because we're in a, you know, quite a, a precious site, we're only yeah. allowed to open up small trenches, yeah. Yeah, one by yeah. one trenches. It's so frustrating, because I bet if we went to just one of these rectangular features, strip the, the whole thing back, yeah. we'd probably really find what we're look looking for. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's what we're all about, you know, it's tough archaeology, I know that. Yeah. But, um, well, and we need to sample, we, need, we really need to sample the site, because we are... Yeah. You know, coming yeah. in and, and looking at all different things. But what, actually, what you just said, I said to Katie last night as we were going to sleep, I said, why can't we just strip it back? Open up a whole structure. We know it's there. We know, you know, we may yeah. find everything we're looking for right in one, but yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a different approach. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's microarchaeology. That, that, yeah. That's yeah. the thing. Almost immediately, Meg comes down on the same spread of small stones that Alice found. This uniform layer of rocks doesn't look like a collapsed building, but with no finds, it's not looking like a boat burial either. It could be just a boat-shaped cairn of stones, but Meg's working on her own theory. I'm digging here because there's something that showed up as a high sig signature, actually a dipole over here, a, a high and a low. So have you got any theory about what this might be? I'm hoping it's something that was burned, uh, or it could be just a different occupation, different soils, use something like that. So you just got to keep on digging? Yeah, keep digging. But we've run out of digging time. All that remains to be done is to record the trenches and evacuate the site before we lose the light. Our survey and archaeological reports may be of use to some brave soul in the future who's willing to take the risks and get in here. The team are disappointed, but as the wind picks up, they realise that getting off now is the only option. This has got to be the windiest it's been. This is the windiest it's been.
tired? I'm very tired and I'm a bit disappointed to be leaving behind a mystery. Wouldn't it be boring if you solved everything? Well, absolutely. That's huh? not what science is about, is it? Yeah, exactly. It's sort of uh, springing right. open new questions. Yeah, so. exactly. I got to excavate today, if you couldn't tell. I got very dirty, yes. <laughs> it was a good day excavating. Good geophysics. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm really tired fully. Everything. Yeah. But it was really good. It's really good. Katie's charcoal samples begin their long journey back to the lab. Where they will be carbon-14 dated, the results will take weeks. One thing I'm slowly learning is that if you're into instant gratification, don't consider archaeology as a career. By the end of the day, I was feeling really, really tired. And so I've opened up a lot of trenches today. I shifted a lot of soil as well. And uh, there's, there's a lot of stones up there, so those are always really hard work to, to move. But it's also been quite disappointing, I've, I've thought, because uh, I haven't found any artifacts at all. Uh, but we did get um, loads and loads of charcoal so we can at least get carbon 14 data. In fact, there was less than 4% charcoal in the soil sample. In order to obtain a reliable date, we had to resort to accelerated mass spectrometry. 865 AD. Wow, oh, well this is a really important date because we know that Vikings are coming across to Shetland at this time. But this is exactly the point where they're converting to Christianity as well. So we don't know whether our site is pagan or Christian. So do we know who lived there? Well, we know they're Viking. And I think we can rule out the fact that it was a monastic retreat because those structures were way too big, weren't they? Knowing the construction methods used, we can now speculate on how these buildings may have looked. Complete with turf walls and roofs, this could have been much more than an isolated domestic settlement. But what we might actually be looking at is the monastery itself. And you thought that all of those buildings were contemporary with each other as well, didn't you? Yeah. And that they're Viking because they're Norse construction, is that right? Exactly. The walls were Norse construction. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we also got out there with all of our equipment and got to map the building. So it's the first time they've ever been mapped. And we've also got the geophysics of the whole slope in the bottom with all that information. Yeah. I mean, I'm, just, I'm just amazed. You know, we didn't get any artifacts at all. And just from that tiny little bit of charcoal, we've actually got a date. And, and not only that, it was absolutely clinical. We only opened eight square metres of trenches. Yeah. And don't forget, we got on the cane in the first place as well. So as far as I'm concerned, it was a job well done. 